as much said as was unsaid. From A Time of Love and Tartan by Alexander McCall Smith Each morning, Big Lou accompanied Finney to Stockbridge Primary School before walking back along Ryburn Place, across the bridge over the water of Leith, and up the gentle slope towards the gardens of Royal Circus Place. She followed the same route each day, as people so often do, crossing streets at precisely the same point each time, finding satisfaction in the routine. And it was not just familiar places that she saw, the same shop fronts, the same street furniture, the same cracks in the pavement. She also encountered the same people, all following their familiar routine, treading a path that they would follow month after month, year after year, until they no longer had to go to an office or a workshop or wherever it was that they earned their living. Sometimes it seemed to Lou that the world was something of a treadmill, a giant treadmill on which we all tramped for our allotted span, covering much the same ground with much the same view. She found herself wondering about the people she encountered on this daily trip. There was that man, for instance, who emerged from St. Stephen Street and paused before crossing the road opposite the flatarium. He always stood there for a few minutes before making his way to the other side, as if uncertain what to do. She saw him look at his watch, then check it again before he crossed the road, reluctant to cross until exactly the right moment, whatever that was, had arrived. Emmanuel Kant, thought Big Lou. Emmanuel Kant. She had just read a biography of Kant, extracted from her shelf of old bookshop stock, in which Kant's famous regularity had been explored at length. And if the citizens of Königsberg could set their watches, according to the appearance of the philosopher on his daily walk, then Big Lou could do much the same thing with this man. Further up the hill, she sometimes found herself walking towards a man strolling down the road towards her. A man she thought of as the poet Hugh McDermott, because he was on the short side, somewhat bowdy-legged and sometimes in a kilt. Over a period of months, this particular man had progressed from stranger to acquaintance. It had started with eye contact, and this, after a suitable interval, had led to a slight nodding of the head. A few weeks later, this had been supplemented with a smile, and finally words had converted the relationship into a speaking one. Ay, ay. The man had muttered one morning as they passed one another on the pavement. I, responded Lou. That had sufficed for a further week. Although a few words were used, such exchanges can be emotionally expressive. The adding of a sigh to the I, for instance, can say so much about the world and its problems. The addition of two sighs can express utter despair at the state of human affairs, just as prefacing the first I with an O can express nuanced emotions ranging from slight doubt 
to sophisticated cynicism, as in this exchange where the translations are parenthesized. Aye, aye, good morning. Aye, good morning. Aye, is everything all right? Any news? Aye, the tone descending slightly at the end. I give up, I really do. Aye, the tone rising at the end. What's wrong? The usual issues? I, yes, the same old stuff. Oh, I resigned. Here we go again. It's someone else's fault, as per usual. You'd think that people would. Then on to Great King Street, where she saw the same lawyer, an advocate, emerging from his door with its professional brass plate, and then beginning to walk up to Parliament House, his formal clothes contrasting with the everyday working dress of most others on their way to work. She had come across this lawyer's photograph in Scotsman one day, and read that he had been given a public appointment. Thereafter, when she saw him, she noticed how stooped he looked, his shoulders bent under the increased burdens of office and the cares that came with it. Big Lou wondered whether it was much different from life in Arbrove or in any of the other small towns up and down Scotland. There were more people in cities, of course, but within the urban centres, for all their crowds and complexities, the same small units of human activity, the villages, persisted. Out of the throngs they saw about them, people created small communities of one or two hundred, ignoring the rest. In a sense, all the others were extras, as in a film. They were there, crossing the scene, going about their business. But what really mattered was the people you actually saw. The people whose faces were familiar, whose backgrounds you understood. The people who knew the people you knew. She thought about this as she crossed Dunder Street to her coffee bar. She thought about it further as she unlocked the door and turned on the lights. As she switched on the coffee machine and gave the counter its first rubdown of the day, she wondered whether she had ever really left Arbrove and Snellmains or whether she carried them still within her and made a new Arbrove and Snellmains right here in Edinburgh amidst all this finance and business and decision-making. Her first customer of the day came in. It was a young man who worked, she recalled, for the Royal Bank of Scotland. He was training for a marathon and had told her all about it and the exercise, he said, justified the bacon roll she made him every morning. She prepared a roll, the bacon sizzled in the frying pan. He sniffed at the air appreciatively. The roll was one of her special butteries of the sort her aunts had been so good at making. This was what Scotland was all about, thought Lou. It was about butteries and people who liked butteries. It was about conversations where as much was said as was unsaid. It was about special ways of breaking the heart. <laughs>